Welcome to Extraterrestrial Reality. Today, uh, I have a very special guest with us here, uh, Dr. Keith Taylor from New York. Uh, this guy has, uh, he's very well known. The, he seems to be a, he's, he, the, when, when people are looking for a police expert uh, in the mainstream media, they, they've, been, they've been contacting Dr. Keith Taylor to come on. He, he's, he shows up on, on channels like CNN, uh, Court TV, CBS. He's, this weekend, he's going to be uh, going to be in an article in the London Times uh, about uh, uh, about uh, involving shootings in the, in subways. Is that what that's going to be about uh, this week? Subway crime. Subway crime. Uh, so I mean, this he, he's all over the place, and uh, I'm really thrilled to have him here. And uh, we're going to be talking about UFOs, uh, of course. But before we do, I think it's important that we we learn a little about a li little bit about who Dr. Keith Taylor is. He's actually a former. New York uh, Police Department officer, uh, and then later on, you are an assistant commissioner at the New York City Corrections Department. Uh, and right now, you're the uh, assistant uh, adjunct uh, professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. And uh, you're, you're on TV a lot. Uh, I mean, I was just this morning I, and last night, I was looking at some of your uh, some of the segments that you appeared on, you're on court TV talking about a babysitting, somebody who got shot during a babysitting uh, uh, by a police officer, gets he gets shot when he's babysitting. There was, uh, you were talking on CBS about the Tyree Nichols incident. Uh, you were talking about the Louisville mass shootings uh, on CNN. I mean, there's just, it goes on and on. When they're looking for a police expert, they bring you on. Uh, on uh, CNN, there was a, a another video that I thought was interesting where you were talking on CNN about a, a, a police officer who ended up shooting someone in the wrist because they were carrying a toy gun, but the toy gun it looked real. Um, and that those kind of things, I guess, happened. I, I, I uh, I thought that that was interesting. I know when my my son was young, he he was used to always run around with the with the guns, uh, you know. But they had those little yellow things on the tips of them to, to let you know that they were not uh, real, but some. I remember the one time arguing with him that, uh, you know, he he didn't have one of those things on. I said, "You can't go out there with that. People are going to think it's real because it did look real. It looked like a real assault rifle." And uh, so you know, that's one thing that people have to look out for when, when it comes to their kids they got to make sure that they that they're that people could know know that these things are fake sometimes you were actually uh, you, you've been how long were you a new york city police officer Dr. 23 years 23 years and uh i mean you were actually uh you, you were there at 9 11 uh you were a detective and you actually had uh, you had you experienced this firsthand. You were right up there, front front and center uh, during this when the buildings were collapsing. Uh, you almost uh, you thought there was a chance you lost two of the detectives that were working with you at that time. That must have been an incredible experience. Yeah, I lost contact with them when uh, everything went black. The, the, the soot and all the dirt from the built it basically turned from day to night, and it was like that for at least like ten minutes. Lost contact with them. Did not get together with them until later on in the day. It was a very, uh, uh, very uh, emotional, traumatic experience. Seeing people die, they're jumping out of buildings. That's something that is seared into your brain. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to the victims, the victims' families, um, because that is something that we can never recover from. We only learn how to live with the uh, pain uh, of that. Yeah, uh, and actually, you actually sent me some uh, some other information here. Some other uh, you, you, there was actually you've been commended. You, you've received like uh, you, you were acknowledged basically by the by the by the uh, uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Here's a picture of you. Uh, uh, you're com completely uh, ready for action. It looks like. When was this picture taken? Uh, approximately 2008, 2009, right around that time period. Um, yeah, those were Hercules teams. I used to supervise heavily armed uh, teams that would go drive around the city in motorcades to uh, go to different sites that they were culturally significant or some sort of uh, <clears throat> maybe a, a financial center or a religious center. And we would stop and spend time at each of those places as a show of force. And in case uh, we were needed for any kind of emergencies, we were available to uh to the department 
And then uh, in uh, it looks like in 2007, you received this from the United States Department of Justice Federal Bureau of Investigation. They recognized you uh, for your dedication and contributions to law enforcement operation carried out by your agency in cooperation with the FBI. Your skills, devotion to duty and ability to work closely with other law enforcement officers were responsible for a significant part of the successes achieved in the priority Invest in this priority investigation. So, what was uh, how did that all come about? Uh, there were uh, there was a, a <clears throat> list of items that uh, were supposedly kept in a safe. Items that were brought back from Iraq by uh, inspectors. Uh, I think there were IAEA inspectors, and the, one of the items was uh, supposedly FOSGI. And so, as you know, that's a very dangerous thing to have in a UN office building. And so we went and uh, and uh, uh, working with the FBI who called us there as well as New York City Department of Environmental uh, Protection. Uh, our team went down range and secured that item and it was immediately flown down to, uh, I think it's Fort Meade, if that's in Maryland. And, uh, and they just, they discerned that it was not uh, phosgene, which would have been uh, a very dangerous situation. Um, and, and I remember when it was happening, uh, the, the F, my FBI uh, counterpart was saying, you know, the White House has been notified and they're, they're tracking this. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a serious situation. I think because the UN went public with it, that's what made it much more, uh, I think, significant than it might have been otherwise. Uh, and so that was uh, acknowledgement from uh, Robert Mueller, who was the head of the FBI, uh, to, to the folks who were involved. And I was appreciative of that, certainly. Um, and I, when I was working in, the, uh, in that unit, the emergency service unit, which is composed of, uh, say, the SWAT function, weapons and mass destruction, or hazmat response for the police department, uh, high angle rope rescue, water rescue, um, different things that the NYPD officers require additional support for. They call ESU there, and that that was uh, that was one of the functions that I was doing, um, which which is what the reason why I was called to the scene, which was why it's part of the FBI NYPD WMD task force uh, during that time period. So this is a 2007, 2012, um, and very fortunate to work with uh, some great professionals, uh, not just within my unit, within the agency, but within many different agencies. So what year did you retire as a police officer with the uh, NYPD? 2015, uh, February 3rd, and I started my new position as assistant commissioner uh, with the Department of Corrections on February 4th. So I had an eight-hour retirement. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept on and did that work for two years. I headed up their intelligence bureau, focusing on um, reducing violent crime within the jails and also uh, re-arrests, uh, holding accountable individuals that committed crimes, mainly assaults uh, within the uh, jail system. So I did that for a couple of years and then I started teaching at John Jay. And so, yeah, so now that's just, just and then at some point, uh, as you're teaching at John Jay, it seems, uh, how did, uh, how, how did you become like a celebrity in the eyes of the mainstream news? And they caught, they call they, they, how did you, how were you discovered? Like, what, how, how did that happen? Hey, it's almost by accident. I was, uh, filling out the faculty page on, on, for John Jay College. And it's, I had a piece, part of it, which you fill out and says, Hey, um, media, do you want to? you know, uh, have some work with the media and, and it checked, I checked off the different areas that I was, uh, that was competent in. And I thought it was sort of training. It was actually to, for John Jay to ref, refer, uh, reporters to speak to me. And so I, I started talking to the various news channels and 400 interviews later, which is about <laughs> four years later, I've become comfortable speaking with the media about, uh, usually not such uh positive incidents or situations yes uh, 
And uh, and and this is, uh, I mean, you're talking about all different. I mean, you're talking about. Uh, I mean, if there's incidents that involve police officers or incidents that involve mass shootings. That's some of the things that they bring you on to talk about. And uh, and because you're, I mean, obviously with your background and your experience, and now you're a professor. I mean, that does make you, or, or you're 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 a professor at the college. I mean, you're teaching uh, uh, criminal justice. Uh, I mean, that makes you, you are an expert. You have, you were in the field for all those years and now you're teaching it. Do you mean? So uh, I could see why they would be bringing you in. Yeah, I would hesitate using the word expert, but I would say I've been fortunate enough to have uh, a lot of experience working in different areas and especially having uh, mentorship from lots of folks to help me sort of get up to speed. Um, and, and I think that humility is really important um, because. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of, a lot of uh, cons things are constantly changing. And so uh, it's quite, quite easy to misinform the public if you're not up to speed on the latest developments of, uh, of things. And so, yeah, I, I definitely, um, I, I am very uh, appreciative of the opportunities I've had and it's because of that reason that I really paid attention to this issue, this UAP issue, because I realized that in law enforcement, regardless of how many thousands of incidents that have involved police officers, there's really nothing about training or, or, or uh, policies or tactics, equipment to help police officers deal with UAP incidents in a, in a rational way to actually help them to save the people that are calling them on 911 for help. And so that's why I've, I've been involved in this, this effort. And uh, also, I mean, there was, I mean, it, there's in addition, you know, before we start talking about UFOs, I just wanted to also bring up that you're also involved heavily in the community. I see that you were, uh, there's some things happening in Harlem where you're, there's, what, what, could you tell us about that a little bit? Sure. I've uh, for, for years been a, uh, a preservation advocate, historic preservation. I was fortunate enough as the president of my local block association to uh, apply for and get a historic uh, landmarking status at the city, state, and federal level for my local uh, area. A additionally, I serve on a number of nonprofit boards. Uh, I've, I've helped start a, a scout troop, Troop 55 in Manhattan. Um, and, and so I, I've had a real focus on, um, a, as I've uh, had the opportunity to provide the, the time and, and effort to, to work in a number of different areas to support uh, my local community, the community board um, for, for many years, which is like a town village uh, board that, that deals with uh, various issues of concern for the community. That's admirable. Uh, I must say that. I mean, you have all you, you basically you have uh, you're involved in all these different things. You have this incredible background, uh, you know, this uh, 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 history working with the New York uh, Police Department. Uh, you work at corrections. Uh, you're high up there. You were a commissioner, assistant commissioner at the, the corrections department. And now and plus you're involved with the community like this. So. What about UFOs? When did you become? <laughs> how did you become an, uh, interested in this? And how are you? Have, this yeah. is this new, or is it something that you've always been interested? I, in? I think it's not going to surprise too many people. Of course, twenty seventeen, the December, the New York Times article comes out, and that sort of caught my attention. But prior to that, I had no interests or or no um, skin in the game, if you will, regarding the UAP issue or UFO issue. I was just focused on very prosaic uh, things um and dealing with them so uh i'm still too busy really to focus on it but it did sort of pique my curiosity but in 2020 when james fox's uh film the uh phenomena came out and i took a look and i said whoa there's some really credible people saying some incredible things um also lou elizondo he had a series on uh, uh on i think a history channel um dealing with the issue Again, very serious, credible individuals that are talking about incredible uh, things that they had seen or experienced. And so that's when I said, I need to take a deep dive. I need to understand a little better 
what this is that people are talking about and how it relates to my discipline, which is emergency management, law enforcement, public safety. And so I, I collected a lot of books and uh, looked at a lot of uh, uh, podcast interviews of folks who are uh, in the tops of their own disciplines. And, and it started going to a few of the conferences in New York City where I was able to meet people like um, Admiral, Admiral Tim Gallaudet and um, uh, uh, just a number of, of folks who are working hard in this area to bring it to the forefront. When I'm talking about it, I'm talking about disclosure. When the, the court, uh, when the hearing was convened July 26th to have um, David Grush, the whistleblower, as well as Ryan Graves, the pilot, and, um, and then Commander Fravor, the other pilot, uh, testifying under oath to Congress, I realized that I had to be there. And I got on a, I got on a, a train, got to DC from New York at like three in the morning and I was waiting on line. And it turns out that the, they only had enough seating for about 30 people. And there were at least a thousand that were waiting on line. And so I was one of the first 30 that was lucky enough to get into the room. And it was electrifying. It was definitely experience, experiencing history in the making. And for me, it really affirmed that I am on the right track and on the right path of bringing this issue to the forefront of, uh, of the law enforcement and emergency management professions. Yeah, you uh, actually were uh, involved with uh, an organization, UAP Med, last year. You, you came out with a white paper. I'm going to, I'll pull it up on the screen here so we could check it out. Uh, uh, and I think I thought it was extremely interesting. Uh, I, I read through this and uh, uh, I mean, this is I mean, this is uh, uh, basically what you're trying to do here is you're, you're trying to establish this. You, you and this group are, you know, would think it's important to establish basically police policies and procedures for first responder for first responders to, when uh, uh, I guess facing this, facing these kind of incidents involving UFOs and or uh extraterrestrial beings yes uh and and not just the first responders but also the folks and, and this is why uh i was very happy to partner with uap med to put this white paper together and all the great folks who, who were involved in it not just the first responders but also the medical and mental health community that normally deals with uh, individuals who have had these experiences and because we're not treating the issue properly, they're basically being misdiagnosed as having some sort of uh, mental health crisis as opposed to actually have some sort of, have some sort of encounter, which um, you know could be very traumatic. Uh, because of this historic uh, mistreatment of individuals who are experiencers, um, it really, that, that that profession is really doing a disservice to those who come into contact with or may be abducted by NHI, non-human intelligence. And so that's why we, we collaborated on this because police and mental health and the medical community often work in tandem when, an, when answering uh, these types of calls of distress. Yeah, I, I, if you go, uh, I'm going to leave the link for this uh, so people could check this out because I think that you know, people in the UFO community need to read this entire thing. It's extremely, I find it fascinating. But you have the conclusion in the opening statement here. It says, as American society struggles to accept the reality of UAP incidents, despite official U.S. government acknowledge thereof, it is critical for first responder agencies to address these incidents with rigor, openness, and professionalism. Developing comprehensive policies, procedures, and protocols will not only safeguard the public trust, but also ensure a systematic and effective approach to understanding and managing UAP incidents. And uh, I guess what's interesting is the fact that really there is nothing right now uh, that, uh, I mean, it's just not right now in, the, in, in this, if there's nothing established. There's nothing like if, if, if police are called upon uh, on an, for an incident involving a UFO in someone's backyard or alien beings in someone's backyard, there's no real policies in, right now established. But you think that it's time that they do establish these policies because as far as you're concerned, you, you believe that we are dealing with something here. Uh, yes, I uh, denoted 18 incidents 
within that uh, white paper that uh, had specific uh, historic uh, from 1947 up to last year incidents where uh, it was quite clear uh, that law enforcement was uh, interacting with, sometimes being injured by uh, NHI. And uh, oftentimes the price of those officers going public with this information was extremely negative. The stigma associated with it, uh, perhaps even getting calls from intelligence agencies or military saying, you know, don't say anything about this incident. Um, some officers having to relocate or no longer be involved in law enforcement as a result of going public with what they experienced. Um, and despite the uh, efforts to destigmatize the issue, I think that one of the areas where it is most difficult to destigmatize is in law enforcement because of the seriousness of the work that is done, the level of trust that officers have in society, and the level of authority that they have when they are uh, stating facts. So, uh, you know, if you go back to 1964 in Socorro, you have uh, Officer, I think it's Officer Zamora, where he, you know, has a very credible, compelling incident, which Blue Book, despite its best efforts to debunk, could not do so. And I think it's one of the cases that changed J. Alan Hynek, who was the ast astrophysicist who was assigned to work with uh, Blue Book, I think that made him sort of have second thoughts about trying to debunk as much as possible because you have a, a human being, officer just doing his job and he rolls right into a UAP incident. I actually, you know, looking at your paper, I, I mean, at this white paper, I, I really like the conclusions here because this was a case where I really thought the police did a really good job, actually. They did everything they could. And you have here the police response to the 1964 Socorro UAP incident was swift, collaborative, and comprehensive. The involvement of multiple agencies underscored the seriousness with, seriousness with which the event was treated. Yet, despite the thorough investigation, the incident remains unexplained, serving as a reminder of the challenges in addressing and understanding first responder contact with UAP. I thought that was, uh, you know, that, that was a case I actually believe where, uh, you know, the police did a fantastic job actually in doing everything they possibly could to gather evidence, report it, take pictures, interview the witnesses, all of it right down the line. That was an excellent uh, uh, police handling of a situation with regard to UFO. And it was also a uh, multi-agency. So you had FBI, you had state police, and, and local police sort of working together uh, uh, to to try to to uh, get witnesses, to get uh, evidence, uh, because all of those things existed in this incident. Um, and you had a very credible witness who did not change his story. He just stopped telling it due to the stigma and harassment that he received as a result. Yeah. And also I thought it was interesting. You included in the first, uh, 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 in the, uh, in the white paper, the first incident that you, you talk about here was, uh, the actually Roswell, which I find interesting. And I was, I was thinking about this, uh, if, and he talked about the police response, the police, basically they, they handed it off to the uh, army air force at the time. Uh, but I, I, you know, it's interesting. You wonder now, actually thinking about this, uh, what would have happened if had the police not contacted the Russell Army Air Force Base and instead just went out and checked it out themselves and brought the fire department with them and then the press? I mean, maybe maybe we'd be living in a different world right now. I'm just wondering. Uh, well, you know, I, I think I remember a uh, relative of Sheriff Wilcox, maybe his granddaughter, that uh, she reported publicly that his her grandparents were told by I assume the army military or component of it not to say anything about this incident. So uh, I'm sure intimidation would have played a role in terms of their ability to share what actually happened. You, you saw the the first reports were telling basically the truth. This is what we've got. We've got the disc and this. But then the rollback, the, the, the uh, we have to reinvent reality 
by stating it was uh, a prosaic uh, balloon. And then yeah. uh, dummies, even if the dummies were not implemented until years after the incident, um, and, and that individuals were confused by dates, and that's why they were making this mistake of thinking that they saw uh, non-human beings when it was actually just dummies so dropping out of the sky you know, five years after the fact. So, you know, it, at what point do you say, well, do I maintain my credibility and my, um, I mean, not credibility, do I maintain my uh, rational thought or do I accept this explanation, which does not make any sense that these, the vast majority of these hundreds of witnesses that were interviewed over the years, the affidavits that they, deathbed affidavits, all these things that are going, Jesse, Colonel uh, Marcel, all these folks who put their credibility on the line to public, go public with it, despite whatever government efforts there were to suppress their efforts, are we to believe that this is all a prosaic incident, a big misunderstanding? And that's just Roswell. There's a lot that we don't know about because if I remember at the hearing, um, Mr. Grush said that uh, he could not say these things in public, that we will basically need, all of us, a need to know and the proper security clearance. And it, and it's frustrating to hear people say, well, I want the evidence now. Give me the proof. I don't believe you unless you show me. You get the need to know and you get the proper security clearances and you will be able to get that information and just talk to members of Congress that don't have that. And they're really frustrated because they're paying the bills and they don't know what it's being spent on. Regarding this, uh, this uh, UAP med, I mean, has any, has any, uh, is there been any progress since last year with regard to this or? Uh, well, I know Ted Rowe, Ted Rowe, who uh, is, uh, you know, he's been involved in, uh, uh, NARCAP and AIAA, uh, he, he's really been um, working on doing additional collaborations, um, additional papers, uh, in particular working on uh, uh, trying to get the uh, mental health community to uh, understand this new reality. It's not really new, but new reality in terms of uh, treating experiencers, uh, treating those who witness things that are non prosaic, not treating it as a mental illness, but instead treating them just as individuals who have seen, you know, something that is just unusual. Uh, we can witness both prosaic and non prosaic things and not have a mental health crisis. Uh, in, in either sense, in, in either incident. And you can even be in mental health crisis and also witness non prosaic things. It's, it's not a mental illness to, to see or interact with NHI. So um, right now, okay, are there any policies at all in any police department with regard, is anywhere in this country, is there any police department that has any policies with regard on how to deal with, uh, like, for instance, what happened in Las Vegas last uh, year? I mean, we in, in the white paper, that case is discussed as that's the very last case that you have in there. Uh, and uh, I mean, is there anything that people, I mean, pol when police are presented with this kind of situation what is there anything written anywhere for anyone to follow in the police in, in... so i i took the liberty of uh just inquiring with about 300 of the largest agencies in uh in the united states each of the state uh police and then uh four of the largest city police departments in each of the states and uh, all of the the, the 25 percent roughly that responded all had the same response, which is that no, they did not have any policies, training, or equipment specialized to UAP incident response. Uh, a few uh, individuals who responded uh, shared that, that they were curious about this issue, and uh, but they had no direction whatsoever. Uh, and and that doesn't surprise me. 
um, I, I would expect that if guidance and uh, policies and equipment specialized to UAP response were to be uh, uh, brought forth to the country, it would be through an entity like the Department of Homeland Security, which deals with Homeland Security, whereas the military deals with national security. Uh, both are very important in keeping Americans safe. Uh, and I think both entities, for the most part, are largely blind to information relevant to this issue, purposefully kept from it. Only a small percentage of people in those entire disciplines are aware of what is actually uh, going on, according to David Grush, whistleblower. So basically, a police officer right now, say uh, Vegas, another Vegas incident happens someplace right now, tomorrow, tonight, next week, uh, and the police are called to it. I mean, basically, they're just going to have to act. I mean, they have no guidance, no, no anything be, that, that that tells them what they should, how they should, uh, uh, you know, handle themselves during one of these situations. I mean, if you're presented with extraterrestrials, are you going to, in a black yard, for instance? Are, I mean, is it a good idea to shoot them? Uh, I mean, if they're coming, I mean, what do you do? I mean, what's how, what's the there is there are no protocols. I mean, maybe is that something that the federal government should be working with uh, police departments? Absolutely. And I, while uh, while I was doing research in this community, I came across an individual. His name is Richard Lang. He spent thirty years of doing investigations into uh, UAP incidents. Uh, first, he did it with MUFON, and then he did it with OSAP. And if you look at uh, the book by Dr. James Lukaski, who was the program manager for OSAP for the Department of uh, DIA, uh, the book was called Inside the U.S. Government Covert UFO Program Initial Revelations. This is what he said about Richard Lang. He said, the excellent performance of Mr. Lang and his star investigators contributed greatly to the success of the OSAP operation. So these were operations that were occurring uh, before even ATIP. This was, this was stuff that was occurring in say 2007, eight, up until 2012, where uh, Richard Lang, he directed investigations nationwide regarding reports of UAP, encounters, uh, interactions. And so he actually wrote a book called UFO Investigation, Police, Fire Department Rescue, A First Responder's Guide to UFO Encounters. And so I, I struck a friendship up uh, with him and he is very familiar with the uh, tactical considerations that officers or first responders may want to consider if they um, come into such uh, an incident, such a, a 911 call. Uh, and I think that the federal government would do well to have a formal position regarding uh, providing the tactical uh, skills, the uh, guidance, the policies, and, um, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the information that, that officers need in order to safely uh, engage with these types of situations. First thing, we get back to the basics is we need to have a standardized reporting mechanism to government, not to volunteer agencies, because you don't re you don't report robberies and assaults to volunteer organizations. You report it to government, to police, or to uh, EMS, medical conditions. But this needs to be squarely uh, in that same kind of category of seriousness in terms of being reported and allowing government, uh, res respective government entities to, to respond. Uh, and, and I think that would go a long way to um, help individuals adjust to this new reality. New in the sense that it's being acknowledged, not new in the sense that it's never happened before. Because if you look at the historical record, there are thousands upon thousands of incidents where first responders have been in compelling incidents called to the scene by uh, civilians that were scared out of their wits, not knowing what to do. Um, and so uh, that these, these first responders have often become experiencers themselves. Uh, and some have been injured. Some 
have not, you know, they, they've been severely injured as a result. Just like in the military, John Burroughs with the Rendlesham uh, incident in England, where he, he is exposed to some sort of uh, radiation or whatever it was that was emitted by this non-human craft. And he ends up with severe injuries. He's not acknowledged by the military. His medical records are classified and it takes a senator in the center of Arizona, John McCain, to intercede to get him the support that he needed. And then you can look at Gary Nolan and Kit Green, two uh, medical, uh, Kit Green, the, the medical uh, doctor and, and uh, uh, Gary Nolan, the, the scientist at Stanford working on studies for the CIA. Uh, look, examining the impact of, uh, of uh, physical damage to individuals, military individuals who have had uh, exposure to uh, non-human craft and have uh, received injuries as a result. So there is a lot of information out there. It's just not acknowledged. And to the extent that it becomes more compelling, that's when it becomes more classified. And so we in the unclassified world are really stuck with a confusing situation where we, we want to understand what's happening, but we're not given the information, the truth to allow us to do so. And the concern about folks losing their minds and, and you know, society uh, falling apart I think is greatly overstated because humans all over the world deal with a lot of very difficult situations and they still survive. I, you know, I find it interesting. I mean, you're someone that, you know, only since 2017 and, and, and you have no problem accepting this now. I mean, it wasn't only till you know, 2017 is when you really started thinking about it. And then 2020 is when you really started thinking about it. And here we are, and you're talking about this and there's, there should be no stigma at this point. I don't think, I mean, like you said, and the you know the government is accepting this. I mean, they're, I mean, you wouldn't see Congress doing all the things that they've been doing, uh, trying to pass these bills, uh, you know, trying to basically, uh, basically trying to help prod on UFO disclosure. That's what it seems like. I mean, they have to know that something's going on. I mean, there's, I mean, the evidence has been there at this point. I mean, to to, de to deny it, it just seems absurd at this point. Uh you know, I had, like a lot of folks, a lot of excitement around the UAP Disclosure Act, the Schumer Rounds Senate Amendment to the NDAA, uh, National Defense Authorization Act of 2023. And to see it dissected, taken apart by powerful forces uh, that had control over congressional leaders, to me, it said two things. The fact that we had this act was an admission, a confirmation of sorts, that government would not only was aware of NHI, but had possession of bodies and craft, which is aligned to what the whistleblower stated, David Grush. The, the second thing is that the fact that it was defeated meant that there was something there that had to be kept from the public. And that something, quite frankly, has to be non-human craft and bodies. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see what's going on. And my hope is that the congressional leaders are working quietly and diligently to correct this situation and get legislation that properly puts congressional leaders in charge of this whole effort and will allow for scientists, academicians, um, others who have a role, I guess, medical uh, community, others who have a role of potentially benefiting energy sector, benefiting from the uh, information, the technological advances that could be gleaned from this craft and non-human intelligence. Um, it's my hope that we can start as a, as a not just society, American society, but as humanity globally to benefit from the information that has been gleaned and uh, the technology that has been uh, attained. 
Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I, you know, I still, I, I'm looking at this whole thing and, and, and really thinking about it right now about how, uh, the importance of it. I mean, it's something that really hasn't been f- focused on. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that, that, that UAP med and, and you talking about this, about the issues with the first responders, not really having any policies or procedures to, to, you know, uh, abide by to, to, and, and, and I mean, isn't it a concern? I mean, when, I mean, it seems at this point, it's like the, the, the jig is up. I mean, we know there's something going on. I mean, okay, how about at least providing the government, the federal government, have to ha- they have to have a better grasp on what's going on here and how to handle these things when, when things do happen other than uh, just calling calling up Washington. I mean, or, or how do police, I mean, it, 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 shouldn't they be the ones providing this information to police, to, the, to first responders? Yes, Um uh... In May of 2023, thanks to reporter Dean Johnson's efforts through his FOIA request, he was able, actually able to get uh, the military's um, uh, their efforts to have standardized reporting across all the different services, military services. Yet he had to do a FOIA request to get that. Is the intelligence community, are they doing the same thing? And can we expect the same uh, policies being put in place for state and local authorities, tribal community, to allow for uh, reporting to government of um, of these incidents, these experiences that people have, in <clears throat> in a in a way that benefits uh, not just society, but it really allows uh, a proper accounting for this type of um, these types of incidents, as well as uh, allowing uh, scientists and others to properly examine uh, the nature of these types of encounters, the frequency. Uh, I don't think that it's any one particular thing that people are experiencing or, or, or are having these incidents. I think it's probably a number of different things. And I think it's important that we all keep an open mind. We should be skeptical, but not in the sense of uh, what's called debunking, which is a sort of religion, a scientific religion called scientism, where you're not going to accept any information that is contrary to your established beliefs about how the world functions and how science functions. So if you see something that is not explainable, like the five observables that uh, people like Lou Elizondo have talked about for years, uh, five observables of craft out there uh, performing in ways that, that clearly could not be done by humans or human-made uh, craft, then you, you, have to, uh, you have to realize that the totality of the circumstances, the overwhelming number of incidents that have occurred, the descriptions of people that do not gain any benefit by exposing themselves or their family members to the stigma involved in reporting such incidents. If you look historically, it does not add up that all of these things are prosaic in nature. If you've got folks in the 50s reporting uh craft with the five observables and then we we try to say well those are drones in the 1950s we don't have things today in the black world that can do the five observables maybe some components of it i would imagine but not the kind of feats that would uh, clearly result in the death of the pilots Um, given the kinds of uh, 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 the physics involved in what these uh, objects or craft are doing. It's just not rational to think that. Uh, so if you're doing that, it's sort of kind of like a debunking. You're not, you're not acknowledging reality. How is the, uh, you, you've been talking, I mean, you talk about a lot of things when you're, uh, I mean, you, you, your focus isn't just UFOs, but I mean, other, your peers within law enforcement have to be aware that you've been talking about this. How, how do they, uh, what's, what's your response from them, your peers in law enforcement, as well as in, uh, in, in college? 
I, I think it's uh, it, there hasn't been much of a response. I think that this has probably been the case, not just for uh, uh, people like myself, but others who have tried to speak in a very rational way about something that has historically been uh, very uh, negative or difficult to talk about given all of the stigma involved about the, uh, the incident. But even while uh, there's not a lot of discussion about it, officers are still experiencing these incidents. They're still having whatever experiences that they're having with NHI. So whether we talk about it or not, it's still occurring. So we need to deal with reality as it is, not as we would like it to be. And I think that is what a true skeptic does. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, you mentioned before uh, Douglas Dean Johnson, he actually did a great job, I thought, uh, basically debunking the Trinity UFO case. I, I think it was pretty clear based on his uh, research that nothing happened there. I, I Unfortunately, I believe Jacques Vallée uh, got duped uh, with that, unfortunately, but uh, it sounded like a great story, but unfortunately there were just too many red flags in it, and he did a great job on debunking that. I think, I think everyone, you know, serious people in the UFO community, you can't believe everything when you first see it. A lot of times uh, some things are, you know, there are prosaic explanations, but not all of it. There's just no way not all of it. So, so with this particular uh, the UAP or UFO issue, uh, I think that it's suffered from uh, some things specifically that make it a little more difficult to deal with than most other topics. Number one, you have folks that have been basically con artists that have been, you know, like, like you just mentioned, not, not, not Jack Belay, he's not a con artist, no. but you've had folks that have tried to con the public. They tried to uh, 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 separate people from their money in exchange for experiences that they promise, which may not be legitimate. Um, you, also have folks that have truly have mental health issues or behavioral health issues that uh, make them believe that they're experiencing something that doesn't actually exist and or, regarding UAP or, or non-human intelligence. And then you have government disinformation campaigns, which David Grush said are highly immoral to um, obfuscate, to confuse uh, discussion about this issue. Uh, to uh, denigrate the reputations of individuals who are simply telling the truth about what they experience or what they know. And so you have all those things, and then you have the phenomenon itself. You have humans interaction with it. And you can't tell me that 60 kids in a small school in rural Zimbabwe in 1994, that they're having some sort of mass uh, delusional experience. Or you can go to 1966 in, in Australia, where they yeah. have a hundred or however many hundred kids that have this uh, interaction. Westall. Something, Westall. And then they have the military come in and tell them not to say anything, especially the teachers. You say something, we'll ruin your reputation, you'll never teach again. And so you, you have to look at the totality of circumstances and say, why would these events happen in the sequence that they're happening unless they're trying to, they meaning government or whoever's in charge, trying to dissuade any kind of inquiries into the subject. And so that is the background that we have that makes it a little difficult for people to talk openly about the subject. Uh, yeah, and it's still it's still ongoing today. I mean, there are like I just recently did a show, uh, and I think you actually commented on it during a different podcast about the forces out there. I mean, forget about uh, the per the reasons for it, but you see it all around us on a regular basis all the time. There are forces out there trying to uh, pretend this isn't real and trying to fool people for some reasons. I don't understand why. I, don't, I just don't understand. And I mean, I you don't really see a lot of people out there, uh, you know, uh, talking about the flat earthers, you know, but for some reason, when it comes to the UFOs and aliens, if there's all these, all these ideas out there against it for some reason, there, but there, there are actually, there's no question about it. There are forces, you know, from debunkers to government officials or whoever, constantly given us nonsense that this isn't real we have no evidence whatsoever which i totally disagree with and, and it might not simply be uh solely government efforts to uh, disinform it could be private entities 
maybe, you know, very powerful contractors for the government that have some efforts to uh, influence discussion around the, the issue or influence people that provide information to the general public or provide guidance and scientific guide, whatever it is. Uh, but it is definitely being uh, it is definitely being influenced because you see what happened to the UAP Disclosure Act. By defeating that act, the folks that are trying to hold on to this information expose themselves. If they had let it go through, then that would have put them, I imagine, at a, a disadvantage. And so rather than give up all the family jewels, they decided to publicly go against the approval of a, a act, that uh, a uh, amendment to the NDAA that was unanimously agreed upon by all the senators that were involved. That's another interesting thing. Well, actually, it was it, it it passed, but it was completely gutted of all the important stuff. So it really wasn't the same bill. But that's another thing that I, I, I I've been noticing over the last few years. I mean, basically, this has been bipartisan. There, there's nobody really. I mean, other other than the couple of people in the House that seem to be getting the contributions from the uh, defense contractors. Other than that, but it seems like this has been bipartisan. It's almost as though they know this is coming. Uh, at some point, you want they're, they're, they don't want to be shown shown up as liars uh, when when the when the shoe finally drops. Well, well I, when you say the, a couple of people in the house, you're talking about the folks that are at the top of the Intel and Armed Services Committee. Yeah. So they, those few wield tremendous influence, and also, of course, the Speaker of the House, uh, the, um, the, the 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 leader for the Republicans in the Senate, um, and 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 key individuals who could defeat this effort or se severely uh, change it so that it's not as uh, powerful. That is all indicative of, I guess you call lobbying efforts to keep the status quo as it is. Don't have the stuff that David Grush is talking about exposed to the general public. And uh, I think members of Congress have even intimated that the effort to even have the hearing, to even get them the hearing room was fraught with pushback, with efforts to, you know, I think they were originally assigned a hearing room that was under construction. Presumably no one would check so that the day of the hearing they'd have said, oh, well, can't have it. You know, we've got this, uh, the room is uh, under construction. They end up getting this smaller hearing room, which can only seat 30 visitors where you have the folks that uh, the security and other folks in, in that in in that uh, uh, facility, that federal building say it was one of the most well attended hearings that they've ever seen in the history of, of hearings, a thousand people waiting online to watch history being made. Yeah. Uh, and I guess, uh, I, you know, you know, where is this heading? I mean, I, 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 from your viewpoint, actually, before I even move on to that, I wanted to say this. I mean, I think that there has to be some kind of a secret control group or secrecy group or something that is controlling this within the Pentagon. That's probably I, I don't know how it's set up or who, but there has I think that there has to be. And it seems like there is some sort of uh, fight going on behind the scenes that nobody's aware of. And I, I do you agree with that. Is that what you're seeing? Do you think that there's a, a fight for disclosure be, between people behind the scenes? We don't even know who they are at this point. I, that's what it absolutely, seems like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not just congressional leaders. It's also stakeholders in the private sector that are, that have their hold on this uh, topic. So it's those who have the need to know and have the clearances to allow them to, uh, really determine where this whole issue is going to go. And they, they hold a lot of the cards. Fortunately for us, we've got whistleblowers that are willing to, at great risk to themselves and their careers and credibility, they're willing to go on the record. And they have done so for years to Congress, which is, I think, how they decided to put the UAPDA together in the first place after all these classified hearings where they're listening to all these incredible stories about craft and bodies that they decided to act on that. So the, none of these things are happening 
independently. They're, it's all leading up to that. So what does it mean that uh, we're currently in a state, a state where at the moment it seems there's a lull in activity? Just because it's quiet, it doesn't mean that progress is not being made. And you have, I would think, people that are finding very hard to, to get this disclosure effort achieved. And it may be in the form of uh, uh, documentaries being made. The, you know, James Fox has this program, the program being made. I think he's going to re-release Moment of Contact, uh, the, the Virginia case um, in Brazil, where they dealt with not just NHI and craft uh, or crash, but also with the uh, U.S. military that came in and picked up what was given to them by the Brazilian government, which I imagine they do all over the world, thanks to the great reporting by uh, uh, Matt uh, Ford and uh, Chris, um, I'm just trying to remember his name, excellent reporters. Uh, the, the one I'm thinking of is British and the other reporter that did an excellent article about the CIA's efforts to retrieve uh, craft of non-human origin all over the world. I think they call that unit the office, the OGA Office of uh, Global Access. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm sorry, I can't remember Chris's last name. Oh, uh, you're talking about Liberation Times. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Christopher Times. Sharp. Yes, he does a great Sharp, job. Absolutely. Actually, yeah. that's and, and there was a third gentleman too, Josh uh, Brawley, I think, that was also contributed to that article. But these things are not happening in a vacuum, even though they're happening independently. And I think that's helpful when you're dealing with a powerful interest group. If you have independent efforts that are not uh, coordinated to fight for the same effort, then you're, you're going to have better results. Because if you try to go one-on-one -on, -one on this uh, very powerful group, they hold a lot of they hold a lot of uh, power and influence, and they're able to defeat a lot of the efforts as we've seen historically to get this information out. Some of the efforts are legal and some illegal. That's something that the uh, ICIG, the uh, Intelligence Community Inspector General, hopefully is looking at. Keith, do you have any? Like, 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 have you reached any con like conclusions, like in your mind, on on why these beings are here and what's going on, or is it just you're you're just I'm I'm confused. I don't know what's going on with it. I know that they're here. I just don't know what they're up to. I, do you have any insight onto that? Have you come to? Well, I I think that. Uh, the diversity of non-human life, intelligent life, is most likely as diverse as the life that we experience on this planet, from the smallest uh, bacteria to the largest uh, whales that exist, and the diversity over time of, of life. So are, are these entities just uh, terrestrial beings or species that we have not been in contact with or we've lost contact with? Are they from some sort of different time space uh, location that occupies the same space that we do? Are they from a different time that, that uh, we don't have the technology yet to be able to emulate? what they do, or are they extraterrestrials from other parts of the galaxy, the universe, of which we find out more discoveries every day as we're able to put newer technology out into space, like the James Webb Telescope. Um, and then there'll eventually be something that is more sophisticated than that, that'll then show additional things that we don't know yet about the universe that we live in. Uh, so I, I think having an open mind um, to all of the different possibilities is really important. And also being skeptical. If someone says that this is what's happening, then you have to, of course, 
have some sort of scientific method to validate what they're saying, which is why this what's happening with the Galileo Project at Harvard is so important and the Seoul Foundation at Stanford and Rice University with their collection that they put together and uh, you know hopefully other academic institutions and other scientists in all different fields will look at this subject area this this whole issue of uap and non-human intelligence in a new light i think uh, throughout the world it's important that we collaborate as not nationals not as russians or chinese or americans but as global citizens as humanity that we work together in discovery and in uh in managing the relationships that exist instead of having a secret arms race to re-engineer technology that we don't we haven't yet had the ability to advance to as, as a race okay and uh i guess i just want to bring this up you know over the past couple of weeks as you know i've been banging the drum i i've been stating uh that uh, i i believe that this this eight recent evidence that was compiled that was uh, assembled by uh the crime scene reconstruction expert scott roeder along with his assistant lewis castillo who has a doctorate in computer animation i've been uh you know, running around saying that uh that uh, on my show, as you probably uh, are aware, that I, I think that this, this is the end all evidence that shows that should show everybody once and for all that this is absolutely real. And uh, uh, I think it is. Uh, am I off my rocker or do you think I, we're on to something here? No, no, I don't think you're you're uh, uh, <laughs> misleading yourself. What I think you're doing is you're applying curiosity, scientific curiosity in the form of having people that are proficient in the different areas of examining the evidence that you have, uh, having them assist and weigh in and provide uh, uh, some sort of uh, assessment. And that's what needs to happen more often, instead of simply uh, in a debunking sort of way, being dismissive and saying, oh, it must have been this. Oh, it must have been mistaken as that. Instead, you have to say, well, let's take a look at the evidence that exists and let's try to figure out what the possibilities are including what the people are saying they see for instance so if they're saying they see something that's eight or nine feet tall and looks like a praying mantis well then if you have evidence that is backing up what they're saying then you examine it you don't just dismiss it out of hand because you don't think that that is possible and so when you you, you look at, you're, you're looking at both the potential of a being and technology, cloaking technology, two things which we don't have a lot of experience with in the non-classified world. And so it'd be really helpful if, if we could get more people to look at this and assess it and, and provide whatever kind of expertise they have to, um, to 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 allow us to 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 even to to have a, a better understanding of what is actually occurring so what people cannot say is that there is nothing there um, and so to so i don't think that you are, are misleading yourself or missing fooling yourself in any way i think it's just that we need to have as much uh as many informed eyes looking at this evidence and looking at the totality of the circumstances, which you've been doing by showing other evidence that relates to this incident. Um, and, and find out, you know, what, what is the best assessment based on the totality of the evidence, not just one particular part of it. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm actually thinking now. Uh, you know, I, I I've been actually, uh, you know, putting things out on Twitter. I, I'm, I've reached out to some professionals. I uh, have not received a lot of responses, and uh, but I'm going to keep trying. I, I think that, uh, like Scott Roder said, he thinks that he wants to have people with the same kind of uh, experience as he has, PhDs or higher or whatever. 
to to look at what he's done and what he's determined and he's saying what he he figures that he's saying it's 100 guaranteed there's a being there and it's using cloaking technology there's no question about it as far as he concerns 100 guaranteed that's what he says so yes. i have to go he's the only expert that uh has really did a deep dive into this video i haven't yet there's been no other experts yet to step forward and that's what i want to see i want to see i do want to see that and i think it's going to be uh i think he's going to it's going to be uh uh, people are going to find the same things that he found. That's what I think. Well, but the only way to find out is to have people do it. Yeah, uh, uh, some sort of peer review process. Uh, yes. You know, somebody write about it and put it in a journal for others to examine and, and say, okay, this is something that has teeth to it. We don't necessarily understand all of what we're looking at, but we certainly see that there is something there that we can't explain prosaically. And that has to be acknowledged. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, I, I would think that as more, as evidence becomes more compelling, it becomes more classified and the most compelling evidence, which has been alluded to to like people like Lou Elizondo, the 23 minute video and all of these other things, which are compelling, but maybe we don't understand, um, the, uh, authenticity of it or where it came from those things sort of keep us from believing what people may actually be recording with the recording devices. So we may be, the problem I think is we can't tell the difference between a well done fake, a CGI versus a real uh, incident taking place. But we have to think, well, it's possible both things are happening at the same time. I say, yeah. Even if we can't tell which one is which, we do know that, that, that there are reasons why people who know about this subject are not allowed to speak about it in, in an open way. They have to measure their words carefully. That's how we should look at this, that there's information that is quite compelling and relevant that is purposely being kept from us and the people that know about it and want to share it cannot do so under a great penalty of uh, imprisonment and fines. So if that doesn't, if that's not clear enough for folks, I, I don't know what will, you know, the, the idea of uh, bringing a body to a function uh, to, as proof, I don't know if that's going to prove anything uh, move the needle. Uh, we saw someone brought a body to a conference in Mexico, and that was met with a lot of ridicule. So I don't know that bringing up an actual body, and I'm not saying that that was a, it was a non-human representation of a non-human body, but I don't know if it was from another place. It could have been something, if it's a real thing, it could have been something that is just as earthbound as we are, or originating from Earth. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, even these, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, I call my show extraterrestrial reality, but I, I mean, it could turn out someday that I'm wrong. I actually do believe that some of these beings are coming from other planets because uh, yeah, I think I, I think we would have known so, about yeah. it. You know, right. But no, I, I, the, the thing is, I think that the first of all, we don't know the whole universe of diversity of entities that are not like us. We don't know. Uh, and we don't know who we're sharing the plant with, for instance. We're not able to get close enough to them because their craft are doing five observables. Uh, so we, we don't know what we don't know. And so again, you think about the diversity of life on this planet. And that's what I imagine would be the diversity of non-human intelligence that's maybe visiting us or maybe origin, originated here or maybe coming from some other means of manipulating space and time. Uh, all those things are possible and probable. So what, what, what do you think? I mean, how, how at some point, I mean, I mean, are, how, when are we going to cross the red line as far as the government is concerned? Do you think that's going to happen anytime soon or, or are they going to be, uh, I, 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 I just don't know. I, I, I think we're getting close to a disclosure and then, then I, then I get uh, pessimistic and I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, the disclosure word, the big D, the small D disclosure means so many different things to so many different people. What is the, is confirmation good enough? Do we have enough for confirmation already? Uh, 
Do you have presidents and former CIA directors and others saying that there's something definitely there? Is that enough for people? We can't share it with you. It's the part that they can't say. We can't let you know what we know because it's classified. That's the unheard portion of their statement. And they may not even be allowed to say that they're not allowed to say it. But that's how I interpret it. So uh, disclosure means for some, disclosure is the president at the day is saying, we have craft, we have bodies. And that may not be politically feasible or possible due to issues with other nations that are not friendly to the United States. Uh, so instead, you know, the scientific community, that's a way of acknowledging. And I think some of like Gary Nolan is what comes to mind. I think it's kind of acknowledged it based on what he said about the materials that he's been able to examine and how they're different. For instance, we can't yet manipulate materials at the atomic level. If that's what he's seeing with some of his uh, some of the uh, artifacts that are left from crashes or or left over from some sort of uh, UAP incident, there are other things that I'm sure he has examined and determined. They really point to a non-human creation of the technology, and then of course we have a lot of information that the government has that they're not quite willing to share. And even with things like FOIA, when people say, well, I'm going to FOIA this and I am going to get a get to the bottom of this issue. National security exception, right? So the redaction is going to include anything that may remotely tell the truth about this issue. And yet we say, well, I've got this report from the from you know the FOIA requests. Well, um, yes, but is the secret still kept? And yeah, so there are limitations. Yeah, I mean, I I, I was uh, actually uh, saying recently that maybe the disclosure that we're going to get is just the fact that we're we're going to be able to prove to the world that there's something here, but the government's just still not going to acknowledge it, and we're just going to have to acknowledge it that they know it, but they can't talk about it. I think that's possible. But that might be what's been happening here. Actually, I mean, when you think about it, say I think that the Vegas alien evidence that just you know, Scott Roeder assembled. I think that that's proof positive. I think that takes us over the red line. That's just my opinion. I'm just not the opinion held by everyone, though. Well, uh, I think it's compelling, especially when you look at all the different pieces of evidence. You look at the whole incident. Can all these people be making this stuff up? Are all those 911 calls, you know, folks are, they're all in on a big joke? It doesn't make sense. No. It doesn't add up. Uh, yeah. And, and then all the individual accounts from the folks, the family members, um, uh, the, the, um, the thing that is burned into my memory is when the officer at the end of that video says, next time something like this happens, don't call us. <laughs> and that's why I was like, case in point, he's got it down pat. That's why we need to deal with this in a rational way, not in a not in a way that doesn't make sense to me what's going to happen here i think uh, i mean this is just a, again a, a speculation on my behalf but 2017 when they released when they leaked those videos i think there was an effort some people are starting to see the writing on the wall uh and, and they think okay we need to start telling people about this everyone has one of these now and it, and it films yes. everything in high definition and and here uh, actually now you see why they might have been doing this because this this kind of stuff is going to it's, it's not just going to be LA or excuse me Las Vegas it's going to be all different uh, events uh, as time goes on there could be another Phoenix Lights event that happens and then it's going to become undeniable I think we're going to find out for ourselves and I think we're going to begin to realize that the government knows about this but they might be in a position where they just can't talk about it because there could be issues ongoing that they know about that they if they'd love to tell you but they can't and that, that's that's a possibility I, I, i've been playing and, around and, and and it's uh not just uh american think globally yes. think uh you know there are indigenous populations all over the world that may have had that may have some sort of relationship or experience with non-human intelligence and um you know probably in the past it's been dismissed 
so we we don't even recognize our the, the, the information the history that we don't know about and our biases sometimes blind us to staring us in the face the reality of this this situation of uap nhi uh existing on this planet with us i just remember the other day hearing uh admiral gallaudet saying that very same thing that we have non-human intelligence that's on the planet and uh you know where we need to find out more about it and then you have folks that say we need to from a national security perspective we need to know what it is that we're dealing with but it is there it's not conjecture or speculation when they say drones i actually came up with a a definition of what a drone is because i understand military sometimes they have double speed and so i i understand drones to mean dynamic rapid obscure non-linear enigmatic ships which express some or all the following anti-gravity lift sudden and instantaneous acceleration hypersonic velocities without signatures low observability or cloaking and trans medium travel so drones exhibiting the five observables means that uh they're not us and they're not our uh you know our rivals our human rivals anyway very interesting um well i guess sort of say uh we've been going on this for over an hour now well over an hour and we probably could go keep going for another three or four or five hours actually because there's so much that we could talk about and we could talk forever but uh i want to say thank you very much dr keith taylor for showing up on my show today it was a, it was it's a great honor and it's been a lot of fun and i really appreciate it very much well the honor was mine i'm a big fan of yours and you we've been You've been a friend in my head for a long time. <laughs> so it's, it's great to finally talk to you and meet you in person, uh, or at least through Zoom. Well, I hope uh, that you uh, you come back again in the future sometime. I would appreciate it because uh, I'm sure there'll be other topics that we could go over with regard to this fascinating t subject of UFOs and extraterrestrials or whatever they are. So absolutely, it'll be my honor and it will certainly be developed and set. We'll both be happy to find out about and want to talk about <laughs> well i really hope you everyone out there enjoyed today's episode with dr keith taylor i just want to remind everyone if you really like what i'm doing here don't forget to like this video and also do not forget to subscribe uh anyway i want to say thank you all for joining me today until next time